So composition of ambient air. Remember we talked about this. Oxygen is 21% oxygen. I was actually informed very recently that it's actually 20.8 and that it's rounded up for our uh, pleasure. But 21% oxygen is what we're, we're talking about. And that's at sea level. It's going to get a little more, a uh, little thinner as we get higher, etc. So 21%. The vast majority elsewhere is nitrogen, okay, and that's about uh, almost 79%. And the rest is just fractions of everything else making a uh, inclusive 100%. So your parts oxygen, that's 21%, and that's your big, that's your big thing what you need to take out of uh, ambient air. Patent City Airway, we talked about the airway. If we have a uh, a nasopharynx that is occluded in an adult, it's not a big deal, right? Because we have the oropharynx is our primary means. If the oropharynx is occluded or in detriment, um, we have, you know, bleeding in there going on, the tongue is swelling up, etc. That's a problem because the opening to our airway is in the back of the oropharynx, also known as the hypopharynx. The nasopharynx is just an additional method of bringing air in. It's our preferred method overall because the hairs and mucus will allow it to clean that air. Um, but ultimately, the function of the upper airway is to warm and humidify that air. If we have a uh, nasopharynx that is occluded, no big deal. If our nose is clogged, we just open our mouths. That's what we, we need to know. The only exception, if we remember correctly, is our pediatrics. And when I say that, it's a very small fraction of our pediatrics, our neonates. Remember, our neonates are going to be from zero to one month in age. For the first four weeks of life or so, you, they are obligate nose breathers. They haven't figured out how to breathe through their mouth yet. So when these kids have a uh, occluded airway, or excuse me, an occluded nose or occluded nasopharynx, that's a big problem. Okay. After that, not so much. Or pharynx we just talked about. Pharynx as a whole is everything north of the glottal opening or north of the larynx. The larynx is your voice box. That's where the vocal folds are. That's where we uh, have the vibration. And based on in the pitch of our voice, it's all made within the larynx. And that marks the end of the upper airway. Everything south of the larynx is the lower airway, consisting of the trachea and the bronchial tubes terminating in the alveoli or the air sacs. Okay, so when we think about people, uh, nah, that's not important right now. We'll talk more about that later. Causes of obstruction, if we remember, our number one cause of obstruction to the airway is going to be our tongue. Especially in pediatrics. Remember Charlie Brown, big heads, small bodies. So in that big head is a big tongue, little tiny airway. Okay, so that's the number one obstruction to the airway is going to be that tongue. Trachea, we have the cartilage rings rolling all the way down straight through the bronchial tubes. Why? Remember to keep those airways patent. Keep those airways patent. Not important with the esophagus going down to the stomach. If that collapses, cool, nobody cares. Well, obviously that airway needs to remain patent, so that needs to stay open, and that's why we have those cartilaginous rings. Opening to the uh, larynx, I know I'm skipping back up a little bit, epiglottis is that little uh, cartilage shield that's, that is anterior to the glottal opening into the trachea, or excuse me, into the larynx. It can swell, it can cause uh, occlusion to the upper airway and ultimately the lower airways. But the epiglottis, that's that little shield, so when you're drinking something, the water is going to hit that and go around that airway, make its way to the esophagus where it belongs. Okay, the uvula is the little punching bag that hangs down at the back of your throat there. Okay, and uh, the vallecula is just a pocket. I know you guys have seen that on your diagram of the upper airway. The vallecula is just a little pocket at the base of the tongue in front of the epiglottis. Not very important uh, for EMTs. It gets a little more important when you become a paramedic. So. But that's pretty much it there. How are we doing? Any questions thus far on anything we've covered at this point? 
book exactly where that is, and I'm not 100% sure myself, so I'm going to be researching that as well after the class. But ultimately, it's the diaphragm. Okay, so everything north of the diaphragm is the thoracic cavity, and south of the diaphragm is the abdominal cavity. Welcome back, James. Uh, the pleural lining. The pleural lining, we talked about that. We have the visceral lining and the parietal lining. Okay, remember the socks and shoes metaphor? So it allows that uh, the lungs to expand and contract. And uh, good view. Okay, the uh, it allows the uh, I'm sorry, I got distracted there. It allows the lungs to expand and contract, and there is a lubricant between the visceral and parietal lining, which allows you to do that without any sort of friction. Because with friction comes pain. Remember. So if you have any sort of thing going on, whether it's a medical condition or you have any sort of infection or swelling within the lungs or the pleural space itself or, or the pleural lining itself, excuse me, or if you get bruised or any kind of uh, physical damage or trauma to your intercostal muscles or your chest wall from the outside, if we get that swelling, as things swell outward, they swell inward as well. And if you compromise that pleural space, we're going to get friction between the parietal and the visceral linings. And then you're going to have that pleuritic rub. You can hear it. Remember I used the thumb and forefinger rubbing together? That kind of a noise. It's a dry rub. The patient is going to complain of pain on inspiration, usually sharp in nature. And uh, that's due to those walls are touching. So lubricant can't get between. And I use also that engine metaphor. If you run an engine without oil, then those pistons are going to seize to the walls of the cylinders. The muscles of ventilation, uh, we go back to muscles of ventilation, your big ones being your diaphragm. Pretty much 80% or more of all your breathing is through your diaphragm. The exception to this rule is going to be our kids. Kids don't have uh, the strength, they are not anatomically formed completely, so they're going to have a lot more accessory use than we are. We're going to have very little accessory use. They're going to have quite a bit. That's, remember me saying that if you watch an adult breathe, we're going to see equal rise and fall of the chest. But if we watch a child breathe, we're going to see a lot of equal rise and fall, so to speak, of the belly more than the chest. Because they're using those abdominals a lot more in their breathing than the adults are going to. And remember, our accessory muscles consist of our abdominals, and they also consist of the intercostal muscles. And the problems with those, if you remember, if we have difficulty breathing, is by using accessory muscles, we are able to force air in and force air out more effectively for a short time. But it's that double-edged sword because with using muscle, it's going to be more energy required. And when more energy required, more oxygen is required. And if you're already oxygen deficient, you're slowly killing yourself by doing that. So it can work for a little while, but ultimately, you're going to go into failure. That's when you're going to go from respiratory distress into respiratory failure. And ultimately, once, that rest, once you go into respiratory failure, you're not going to be tachypneic. I'm looking using some medical terms there, thinking back to anatomy. Okay, tacky is fast. Nia, hey, welcome. How you doing, Jason? All right, we haven't gone very far. Uh, we're just reviewing some things. So... Um, remember, when we get into failure, tacky means fast, nia refers to air, and then ultimately we're going to start slowing things down. Okay, We're going to get to bradypnea, or you're going to become bradypneic. Brady meaning slow, nia meaning air. So your respiratory rate is going to slow down, and that's in failure. Ultimately, it's going to stop. So you're going to go from respiratory distress to respiratory failure, to respiratory arrest. So unless we start getting some adequate ventilation. And that's where positive pressure ventilation really comes in handy. Because remember, our inspiration is an active process. Our exhalation under normal circumstances is a passive process. When you start having respiratory distress, both your inspiration and your expiration become an active process, meaning a both use energy, which is completely inefficient. 
and ultimately it's going to fail. By using that positive pressure ventilation, you've now made inspiration and expiration a passive process. You're using that air. So instead of creating negative pressure within the thorax, you're pumping air into the thorax. You are, you are going against the pressure gradient mechanically by using a bag valve mask or even a mouth to mask uh, type device. So you're inflating the lungs and what you're doing There are six other callers on the call. Let it go out on its own. So you've taken away that energy use. The threats that they're getting during that respiratory distress is now you're getting that big full breath, right? Because if we use a bag valve mask, we have one liter of air. Now they say the average person is inspiring about 500 cc's. That's probably right. If we're just sitting resting, taking it nice and easy, yeah, 500 cc's. Ultimately, we can go in about 2,300 cc's is our max, which is quite a lot of air. But we don't really do that. Even when we're running, we don't inspire that much. The only time you ever really see that kind of thing is when you do that ridiculous breathing test at, at the doctor's office. I don't know if any of you have had to do it. It's horrible. But anyway, by using a BVM, we're able to force in more air per breath, plus allow the patient to use less uh, energy per breath. So we are fighting the process, that respiratory distress, two different ways. Not to mention, besides taking away that with ventilation and putting in more volume, we're increasing the oxygenation level. By the mask seal and the supplemental O2 at 15 liters per minute, we're providing that patient, instead of that 21% air with better ventilation, now we're providing 100% oxygen with a better delivery method as well. And that's how come bag valve is so effective, or mouth to mask with supplemental O2, mind you, if you're doing mouth to mask, is so effective for ventilating a patient and uh, allowing better perfusion to that patient. Is everyone still with me? Go ahead and chat it out or just yell it out if you're on. Cool. All right. Good. All right, moving to the next is adding it's a relaxed state is normally dome shape. We're flattening that out. We're contracting our intercostal muscles, which are pulling those uh, ribs outward and upward, creating a larger overall space within the thoracic cavity. We're creating that negative pressure just due to natural laws of diffusion. Air is going to rush on in. But in order to contract those muscles, we've got to use that energy. And that's how come we're an active process. Inhalation, all we're basically doing is relaxing at that point. Everything's going to go back to normal and cause inward pressure because we're basically making a smaller space. Therefore, due to diffusion, we've created a positive pressure gradient inside, and that air is going to flow out into the atmosphere to create equilibrium. Moving on. Okay, let's see here. Minute ventilation, okay, once again, uh, tidal volume, which is how much air per breath measured in cc's or milliliters, they're the same, they're a synonymous term, times the amount of breaths per minute equals minute ventilation. And now that you know that, you're going to probably need to know it for a test, maybe even the National Registry, and then ultimately when we get out into the field, whoop-de-doo. Respiratory therapists, respiratory techs, all that stuff in hospital, long-term care, they give a hoot a lot more about that kind of stuff than we do in the field. Okay? Ultimately, we don't really care what the minute ventilation is. We know that if we're giving good, solid breaths of air with the bag, bag valve mask and we're giving it at a rate of once every five to six seconds on an adult patient, we know we are providing proper ventilation. And ultimately, they're going to have a good minute ventilation volume. Do we care what that number is? No, we don't. It's merely interesting. In alveolar ventilation, ultimately that's what we're trying to achieve. You don't need to worry about the math. Don't worry about the math. What you do need to worry about is letter B, which is dead air space. In an adult patient, an average adult patient, we have about 150 cc's of piping 
that we have to move air through in order to get to the alveoli. So what that means is the alveoli, the only place gas exchange can take place. So if you have that patient who has asthma or anxiety and they're breathing 30, 40, 50 times a minute in these shallow rapid respirations, all they're doing is, unless they are breathing with each ventilation more than 150 cc's of air, they're not getting any of that air to their alveoli. And if they're breathing, say, 250 cc's of air in these rapid breaths, only 100 cc's of that breath is making it to the alveoli, which makes that breath really ineffective overall. They're not getting enough O2 to sustain. So dead air, they need to overcome that. Uh, we all remember signs of mechanical ventilation impairment. We saw that picture of the old man. He's in that tripod position. Remember, the body is smarter than you are. We're going to have larger nerves. We're going to have that head in a sniffing position, opening that airway. We're going to have tripod position, leaned forward, take, having gravity help us, taking thoracic weight and thoracic resistance off. If you're laying down, you have to push the weight of your chest up in order to take that breath. If you're in a tripod with that lean forward, you don't have any of that. You're using less energy. Not to mention you're in an upright position and you're barrel chested out, providing maximum surface area to allow maximum expansion of those lungs. The pursed lip breathing, that's going to come, but that's going to cause that back pressure. Remember we mentioned in the acronym PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure. They provide back pressure within the alveoli, allowing them to stay popped open because do you remember that term that I spoke of, a collapsed alveolus? What's that called? Think about it. At atelectasis. Atelectasis is the collapsed alveoli. So positive end expiratory pressure prevents that. We get that in a bag valve mask because there is some built-in PEEP. And we get that with pursed lip breathing. There's built-in PEEP. That, and that's what we do when we yawn. When we yawn, we're not getting enough air into our lungs because we're tired, so we're not breathing as deep as we should. So we yawn, and that causes that back pressure, that peep, and it causes those alveoli to pop open, maximizing surface area for capillary gas exchange. The effects of inadequate tidal volume and respiratory rate, yeah, we already know that. Hypoxia, respiratory distress, respiratory failure, respiratory arrest. Moving on. Any questions thus far? Just throw it out on chat. All right, cool beans. Moving on. All right, about the stretch receptors, is that they're there? And what those guys do is they dictate how big of a breath you need to take, OK, based on the stretch of your lungs. Okay, the J receptors is the capillary pressure. There needs to be amount of pressure within the capillaries at the alveolar level. Okay, and if there isn't enough, it's going to boost your blood pressure. It's going to boost your heart rate a little bit. It's a J receptor. Okay, it has to do with ventilation because you need enough pressure to be able to cause that hydrostatic pressure that we talked about before, so you can have that offloading of CO2 and waste products and that onloading of uh, oxygen. Let's see here. Okay, back to chemoreceptors. Remember, we have the two areas of chemoreceptor that are your biggest concerns. You have your central and your peripheral chemoreceptors. Your central uh, chemoreceptors are located in the respiratory centers of the brain, up in the brain stem, just north of the medulla oblongata, which is why alligators is honorary. And it is, they basically run on carbon dioxide. Okay, so they are in hypercarbic drive or hypercarbically driven, and they are very, very sensitive to the carb, uh, CO2 content within your blood. Because ultimately, what they're for is they're help, trying to help regulate pH. We're going back to that, remember? So if we have a little too much CO2, that means we're going to have more acidic blood. Okay, so it doesn't want that. It wants to be neutral, actually a little on the basic side. So if we see too much CO2, we're going to speed up respiration to try to offload more CO2 and ultimately keep everything in balance. It's very sensitive, the central chemoreceptors. 
not as sensitive is the peripheral chemoreceptors located in the aortic arch and the carotid sinuses, I might add, okay, up in those carotid arteries down at the base of your neck. They are in hypoxic drive. So they basically say if your amount of oxygen in your blood is too low, that's when they say we need to speed up respiration. They're also clumsy. All of us are nice and healthy. We all should be in hypercarbic drive running off of our central chemoreceptors. However, do you remember we talked about a certain population who runs the other way? Those are our COPD patients. Our COPD patients. Hang on one second here. Whoops. Okay. Glad you're back, James. I don't know how much you missed, buddy. Excuse me, in the brainstem north of medulla oblongata. So the other, what happens though is, remember in that population, generally smokers are, are, um, are COPD patients. Those guys have been slowly smoking and destroying all of their structures and basically having an excess of carbon dioxide for a very, very, very long time in very small doses. And just like people can build up tolerances for poisons and the like and other toxins with very small exposures over the years, you can build up a tolerance for CO2 toxicity. So basically what happens is these guys, their SpO2 slowly starts creeping down over years and years and years of smoking. Griffin, I need you to take that in the other room or turn it down. I'm teaching students here. Okay, so what happens is that all of them, you know, you get grandpa, he's been smoking for 35, 40, 50 years, he's going to have an SpO2 level of 91%. Many of us had 91%, we're going to be freaking out in a hypoxic event and you're going to have to do all kinds of things to try to help us out. These people are going to be trucking along just like you and me. Chances are they're going to be wearing a little nose hose, a nasal cannula with a little low dose of oxygen in there, probably be smoking while they're wearing it because their body has slowly become used to dealing with that. The problem with that is uh, with COPD patients, they have that decreased level of oxygenation and they have now lost the ability to effectively get rid of carbon dioxide. So now they have an excess of carbon dioxide in their blood and in their lungs at all times. So what that has done is that has actually dulled their central chemoreceptor up in the respiratory center of the brain. So what that does is they now are running basically just on their peripheral chemoreceptors down in the aortic arch and carotid sinuses. So they are in what's called hypoxic drive. They don't respond to those high levels of CO2 anymore. They respond to low levels of oxygen. 91% to them is not low because they've been dealing with it for all these years in very small doses and you're used to it. If they, when you go on these folks is when they get down into the 80s or into the 70s, then they start having your issue. And remember, the problem we have with our hypoxic drive people is that if we start supplying them with high concentration oxygen, we give them an O2 mask with 15 liters of O2. We bring them up to anywhere from 96 to 100 percent because they're now flooded with oxygen. If that is kept up over the course of a number of hours, the body says, hey, I'm getting way too much oxygen, so I'm good. I don't need to breathe this hard. And ultimately, they can put themselves into respiratory arrest. And that is the complication with hypoxic drive. So, what does that mean for EMS? Nothing. We had that conversation before. It was an old myth that was debunked long ago, but it is a consideration when a patient has been in a nursing home. Griffin Hunter, inside, now. Ultimately, the reason, when, whenever we may deal with this as EMS, is pretty good about this. This is basics. But nevertheless, it is noteworthy to understand. Or if you have any sort of prolonged transport of these patients. For instance, years ago, 
I had a patient who I transported from St. Joe's in Phoenix, that's 3rd Avenue in Thomas. I transported that patient on high flow oxygen to El Paso, Texas. Now, this particular patient was not in hypoxic drive, so ultimately it was not a very big deal, except that I had to take a number of large oxygen cylinders with me. So, but if we had a patient who was in hypoxic drive, and we had that same long transport or a similar long transport, we're going to have these complications. So at that point, you're going to have to dial them down off that high flow O2 and keep them on the minimal amount of O2 that can keep their saturation level effective or find another means of fixing them. Now, ultimately, guys, if we have a patient that's in that sort of deal, most likely it will be a paramedic transporting them, but you never know. Stranger things have happened. I want you to be prepared when you go to the field. Okay, there's ventilation perfusion ratio. Don't worry about it. Nobody cares. You're merely interesting. Forget it. Moving on. James, that means you. If you spend any time trying to memorize this crap, don't worry about it. We're going to move on to more important things. It's not going to be testable. talked about that pretty much. Let's see here. We talked about alveolar capillary gas exchange. Here's a nice little picture for you all. Perfusion and shock. Okay, here's a cool little flow chart. So, oxygen dissolves in the plasma, attaches to the hemoglobin. Carbon dioxide dissolves in the plasma, attaches to the hemoglobin. Mostly uh, transports through your blood in the form of bicarbonate. We talked about that a little bit. Alveolar capillary gas exchange, we have the onload of O2, offload of CO2. Cell capillary gas exchange, same thing happens, just down in the interstitial spaces. Onload of oxygen and other nutrients, offload of CO2 and waste products. So, if we have any sort of transportation disturbance, or any sort of cellular perfusion disturbance, or anything going on, that will disturb that ability to that CO2 to be offloaded and that oxygen to be onloaded, you're going to have cellular hypoxia, which is going to go uh, systemic, and you're going to be have a problem with end-stage perfusion. So low perfusion is called hypoperfusion, which is medical jargon for shock. Okay? So shock is hypoperfusion. There's a many different ways that you can have shock, and we're going to talk about all that kind of stuff when we get to the shock chapter down the line. But that's really all it is in the end, is just you are not getting adequate tissue perfusion to support life. And that is what shock is. We talked about all this, uh, most of this. All right, actually, no, I guess we didn't yet part of it. Composition of blood is mostly plasma, your large proteins, okay, and some small proteins as well. But this is where albumin, that's the big one, okay, that's the one that's really important for osmotic pressure. Red blood cells, okay, of your formed elements, this is the biggest one, 98% red blood cells, primary function, transporting oxygen and carbon dioxide on the hemoglobin of the blood. White blood cells, it's all having to do with your inflammatory and your immune system response. Uh, platelets, that has to do with your clotting. Your distribution, your high pressure side is your arteries, arterioles, med arterioles, that's kind of between B and C, and then ultimately capillaries. And then it seamlessly goes into your low pressure side, which is also capillaries, into the venules, into the veins, and then back to the heart and into the pulmonary veins where it can reoxygenate and offload its CO2 products. Hydrostatic pressure is that pressure pushing the blood out into the interstitial spaces for onload and offload of oxygen and nutrients. And then the plasma osmotic or plasma oncotic pressure ultimately is that return out of the interstitial spaces back into the vascular system. Cardiac output. It's a lot like your minute ventilation. Cardiac output is your stroke volume, how much blood is pushed out of the heart with each, prep, with each push, and then how many times your heart beats doing that per minute. And remember, how efficient is your heart? Your heart is 
about 65 to 70 percent efficient in normal circumstances. That's known as ejection fraction. Okay? Ejection fraction. And your heart abides by whose law? Frank Starling's law. Remember the rubber band law? Basically, the more stretch the more stretch you have, the more that heart fills and those walls stretch, the greater force and pressure it's going to contract with up to a point. Remember we talked about the elastic underwear band. You can stretch it and stretch it and stretch it and ultimately if you stretch it too far, it won't stretch back. It'll be loose. A rubber band, if you stretch it too far, it's going to snap. The same thing works with your heart. Once it stretches too far, you can damage those tissues. You pull the muscle. You tear the muscle. That's what happens, and that's known as Frank Starling's law. The influence of the autonomic, ner autonomic nervous system on cardiac output. Remember, it's your fight or flight and your feed or breed, also known as your sympathetic or your parasympathetic nervous system. It's part of the autonomic nervous system, which is part of the central nervous system, not the peripheral. The peripheral nervous system has to do with motor sensory, pain reception, and muscle movement. Okay, so with the sympathetic response or sympathetic tone that you're going to have an increased heart rate, an increased force of contraction, and uh, increased conductivity, also known as automaticity of the heart, and that also is going to control the contraction of your blood vessels. So if you have a sympathetic response, the blood vessels are going to contract, causing more force, the heart's going to be harder, faster, and easier. The parasympathetic response is that counterbalance. That's the guy that's going to slow you down. That's your feed or breed. Heart rate's going to slow down. Vascular, uh, uh, vascular system is going to dilate. And things like sexual organs and digestive organs, those are going to kick into high gear. Okay, that's where you digest. That's why after we have sexual activity, we want to sleep after. It's all part of the parasympathetic nervous system. The main uh, chemo... Uh, or excuse me, hormones involved in both of these, your paris, excuse me, your sympathetic is going to be epinephrine, with some norepinephrine as well. Epinephrine is the one you want to be concerned with. The other one for your parasympathetic is going to be acetylcholine. Okay? Moving on. Covered a little bit. How are we all feeling? Are we good? Are we bad? Are we confused? Are we not confused? Give me some feedback. because the heart can only compensate so much. There are medical conditions out there where that heart starts beating fast enough that it becomes inefficient. It becomes inefficient because you are not allowing adequate time to, for the chambers to fill with blood. Therefore, you're going to be putting out less blood and it's going to decrease overall cardiac output. Low heart rates, same thing. Low heart rate, if you have a lower amount of heart rate, you're not pushing as much blood. It just makes sense. Decrease in myocardial, excuse me, low blood volume. If I don't have enough blood in my veins, it doesn't matter how my heart's beating. My pressure is going to go in the tank. Ultimately, <clears throat> I'm not going to have that end perfusion like I would desire, like I need to sustain life. Decrease in myocardial contractility, <clears throat> same concept there. If the heart is not able to physically contract well enough or physically relax and expand. Okay, If we have a hole in our chest and we have air building up inside our chest cavity, it's going to apply pressure to the outside of our heart, squeezing our heart. So it cannot expand enough to fill completely with blood to its maximum capacity. Therefore, it's not going to be able to push out very much blood, is it? Now let's look at high blood pressure. High blood pressure can be good to a point. Okay, So the problem is, why are we in that high blood pressure? Initially, blood pressure is a compensation mechanism. If we have decreased cardiac output due to a lower heart rate, decreased cardiac output due to myocardial contractility, or low blood volume, we're going to increase our blood pressure to support that perfusion. But 
ultimately that can cause issues okay because the problem what's causing that increase in blood pressure can get so bad thank you can get so bad that you're not going to be able to support that perfusion additionally if that high blood pressure is a medical condition like let's say you eat a whole lot of god knows what here's looking at you fried foods okay and we have a lot of plaque buildup so our we naturally have high blood pressure due to poor diet or medical conditions or a bunch of other different things which we can talk about later when we get to cardiac emergencies well that we're gonna have high blood pressure all the time so that can be a problem because that high blood pressure is acting on that plaque meaning it can bust a piece of that loose and cause a clot it can cause a stroke okay or it can cause a weak portion of a blood vessel to tear which can be a big problem. If that happens down in the uh, inferior aorta, okay, that's the abdominal aorta, basically we get what's called an aortic dissection and ultimately a triple A, an uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm. It's a weak portion that's going to take up a bunch of blood. It's going to cause your blood pressure to tank, and if it bursts, you're dead. Or if we have a weak portion up in your brain, that's also called an aneurysm, and if that bursts, now we have a stroke with a hemorrhage, which is going to get bad, and those things, people who have those things don't generally do well. Sorry, taking a drink. All right, systemic vascular resistance. That is the amount of resistance. This is afterload. When we talked about preload and afterload, this is... Uh, except where afterload deals with just the aortic arch portion of your body, uh, this deals systemically. The amount of pressure due to what your body's doing, due to a sympathetic response, due to plaque buildup, due to arterial sclerosis, due to uh, atrial stenosis, valve disorders, anything you want to call it. The amount of resistance your body has to overcome in order to be able to pump blood and actively perfuse the rest of your body, the rest of your tissues, is called systemic vascular resistance. Okay, the rest of that stuff we kind of talked about already. We already talked about the uh, microcirculation. Okay, um, true capillaries are the capillaries. When they talk about essentially false capillaries are not true capillaries. They're referring to the med arterioles, which is part of the capillary system. Okay? So true capillaries are those guys that we talked about. Those are the soaker hoses of your body. We talked about all that. Moving on. Blood pressure, baroreceptors. Basically, if there's not enough pressure in your arteries, your blood, your body's gonna, it's gonna read in a baroreceptor and it's gonna say, hey, we need to boost the pressure. Ultimately, they're gonna do that. Okay, these are kind of redundant, so we're moving on. Let's see here. Uh, it's an excessive. So the units of our body, or excuse me, the units our cells use for energy is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. We get that from glucose. We get that glucose from all kinds of things. Simple sugars, complex carbohydrates, proteins, etc. We get a lot of other things, like protein, from proteins, but ultimately our body uses sugar as energy. Glucose is the form of sugar that it uses. It breaks down in glycolysis. It goes through the Krebs cycle. The first time, it does not use oxygen. It yields two ATP molecules. And then if we have oxygen with it, we are in aerobic metabolism. We push through again the second cycle, and we get 34 more ATP, ultimately yielding in 36 ATP in aerobic metabolism that your body can use for the keys, remember ATP is the key to the sally port that allows the sodium potassium pump to work properly. So if we do not have oxygen, adequate oxygen perfusion, 
we are going to go into anaerobic metabolism. It'll start off locally and go systemic. So the body is only allowed to go through one cycle of the Krebs cycle. Therefore, we're going to yield two molecules of ATP instead of 36. And where the other one is going to yield heat and carbon dioxide as byproducts, we are going to yield heat, but we're also going to yield pyruvic acid. Uh, it's just that, it's that nasty, remember I used the uh, diesel truck metaphor? So it's that black particulate matter, or the smoke metaphor. The clean flames don't have smoke, the dirty flames have nasty black smoke. So what's going to happen is you're going to have that dirty black smoke in the form of pyruvic acid. When it leaves the cell, it becomes lactic acid. Lactic acid is going to change that pH in your body. Initially, your body will compensate because it is a little bit basic, and we do have that carbonic buffer. If it continues for any length of time, your carbonic buffer system is going to be overwhelmed. Your body is going to become acidic. Ultimately, cells are going to die. They're going to lyse themselves. Yeah, the lysosomes within your in your in your cells are going to dissolve the cells. They're going to swell, rupture because the sodium. What's going to happen is the sodium potassium pump is going to fail. When it fails, all that sodium is going to keep rushing into those cells, and it's not going to be bilge pumped out. This what follows sodium? Water. The water is going to rush in with the sodium. The cell is going to swell. It's going to rupture, and all that shit and acid is going to spill into the bloodstream and it's going to domino effect. It's going to cause an acidic environment within the body. Medications aren't going to work properly. Cells are going to die because they don't like living in acid. They like nice new environments. And ultimately, you're going to be in a nasty state of shock. You're going to be in what's called acidosis. You have respiratory acidosis first, and then you're going to get down to a cellular level and you're going to have what's called metabolic acidosis. Once you're in metabolic acidosis, you're probably going to stay there. Okay. When we get to cardiac emergencies, we're going to talk about the three phases of cardiac arrest. You're going to have the electrical phase, the chemical phase, and ultimately the uh, metabolic phase. Um, the one in the middle is not called the chemical phase, but I can't pull it up right now because my brain hurts. So we're going to move on because we're going to talk about that later. Uh, let's see here. So support the sodium potassium pump or you're going to die. Any questions on that guy? Okay. So, basically, this is the end of my portion of this. Ruben is going to take you into um, lifespan development.